Welcome back to In Other Waters. At the end of the last episode, we came back from the buried Baikal base and came away with a lot of information and a lot of new samples. There's also a couple other bases that we need to explore, other Baikal outposts. But before that, uh, let's take a look at all the new information that we've gotten. And also, we still have some things to look at at the Baikal base that we just came from. We didn't explore all of it. Yeah, we have ton of taxonomy entry updates. Slow masons. We have everything for those. Observations. Slow masons are colorless polyps covered in waving cilia, which etch elaborate spirals into the facility they feed upon. These pale, formless creatures are solitary, but not exclusively so. Some accumulate together in groups, hugging against each other's mass. There appears to be no obvious chemical exchange or communication within these groups, but perhaps the patterns they form as they eat serve some social purpose. Their exteriors show frequent evidence of consumption by other species, with no obvious method of defense. Upon being threatened by pressure, the polyps recoil, but do not appear to possess the ability to flee rapidly nor fight back. Perhaps sampling their secretions might help us to understand the underlying patterns behavior. Analysis of the patterns secreted by the slow masons suggests something close to rudimentary communication. There are repeated motives created by multiple members of the species, unlikely to have emerged simply from their natural movement and feeding patterns. Due to their slow pace, it would take an extensive amount of time to determine and prove a correlation between rhythmic alterations in the pattern and events faced by the polyps whether they represent warnings, a form of social engagement, or markers of potential nutrient sources, remains unclear. But how are these patterns perceived by the other masons? Without any obvious eyes, they cannot see them. But perhaps, like Braille, these secretions are read by touch alone. Theories Analysis of the strange molted skin I found in the Arcology Caves shows it's clearly formed from the flesh of slow masons. Within the tissue, the bodies of multiple polyps have knitted together over the span of decades, forming one larger communal layer. It may have provided protection, or perhaps it was the birthing sac for some larger unknown form? Shed skin can represent evidence of renewal or transformation. Perhaps the polyps are not mature, but are a larval stage of the species, with each member uniting to form a larger being. As of yet, I found no trace of this matured form of mason, but the cave networks of the ocean floor could hide many creatures that could easily evade discovery. those patterns. They're so interesting. They look very organic. Almost like how plant stems or leaves might grow sometimes. Abyssal sail shell. Uh, this is completely new, right? think so, so we have observations and theories. These shelled creatures with their large, translucent tails are surprisingly fast for animals of their kind. Occasionally spotted weaving between veils in the deep, they use this speed as a way of evading the slow-moving tangles. They're also dark in color and small, making them a difficult target for other creatures that might hunt them. They use modified back legs with wide oar-like shapes to both propel themselves and make rapid turns. But most distinctive of all their features is their large translucent tail which stands like a crest behind them. From my observations, these tails seem to be a form of propulsion for the sail shells, but until I can inspect a fragment of one in more detail, this cannot be confirmed. Theory. After analyzing a clutch of beaded sail shell eggs and inspecting their anatomy, I've started to understand their behavior. Larval sail shells are already forming modified limbs with thin thread-like whisks on them. These limbs move so fast when the sail shell is swimming that they can't be seen, but in the dormant eggs they're clearly visible. 
These whisks would allow the sail shells to feed by catching small larval creatures, as well as any other particles of nutrients found in the water. This must be what the sail shells are doing when they follow their carefully selected paths back and forth through the water. It's also likely that the veils attract, trap, and produce tiny particles that the sail shells feed on, hence their close proximity. The result for sail shells is a very risky feeding pattern. Cold fire fan. We have everything for that. These tall fan-shaped filter feeders can be found in the deep ocean of Gliese 667cc, where they glow with a distinctive warm bioluminescence. The centerpieces of the deep ocean's oases of life, cold fire fans and their flame-like pulsing light attract many other creatures to live around them. How this benefits the fan isn't precisely clear, but there are many possibilities, including defense and sustenance. Although the fans themselves do not lack in defenses, as unlike the smaller and paler fans which can be found in the bloom, cold fire fans have a sheddable mucus sheath which stops them becoming overgrown with other plants and creatures. Sampling and analyzing these sheaths might give some further insight into the role they play in the fan's eating habits. Behavior Getting hold of a cold fire fan's sheath has brought many other samples with it. The sheath itself was covered in pollen, mic microbiological colonies, even fecal matter. It seems that the sheath acts as a barrier for large particles, blocking them from reaching the fan's spines, while smaller particles pass through and are digested by the fan. The fan's light is then a beacon, specifically intended to bring creatures into its glow, benefiting the fan with the resulting increase in particles in the local area. The sheath stops this from becoming overwhelming for the fan and can be shed in order to protect it. The patterns of the fan's light remain mysterious though. Why does each individual display different pulses and waves at different times? Theories Analysis of the cold fire fan spine we acquired shows that fans not only possess light producing cells, but also light receptors too. These incredibly sensitive cells are found on the front of the fan and show the fans are able to perceive the lights of other creatures, including other fans. As each fan tends to its own oasis, perhaps the fans use their lights as territorial markers, signaling to other fans that their basalt column is taken. They may even use them to communicate with other species, responding to the flashing patterns of veils, for example, and letting them know not to approach their territory. Like lighthouses, cold fire fans seem to act as both safe havens and warning signals depending on the creature they're signaling. Snare Veil. We have... Uh, well, we don't have behavior as a new thing, which means we've already examined this before, so I think just the theory and sketch are new. Yeah. Theories. Having sampled a dying veil, analysis of the tissue demonstrates what a unique creature a snare veil is. Its tissue is threaded through with powerful neural connections lined with a digestive surface like the interior of an animal intestine, and coated with a layer of light-emitting cells. It's as if a single creature has been turned inside out and rolled out until it was a flat plane, millimeters thick. A snare veil is a totally distributed form of life with no centralized brain, stomach, or other organs at all. It is self-same in its entirety. Any other piece resembles another. What we saw as a dying veil might have been purposefully separating itself, as each piece of a veil could grow another tangle. No wonder they have dominated portions of the seafloor. Water bulb. Got everything for it. Water bulbs are pale, soft, egg-shaped creatures with transparent sections in their outer membrane. Water bulbs filter water through their interiors, which are hollow, apart from a single gelatinous sphere which sits at their center. 
Their anatomy is so unique that it's difficult to understand exactly what these incredibly passive creatures are doing. They seem to have small, stump-like legs at their base for stability, but it's unclear if they can use them to move. Water bulbs seem to simply sit and filter water, while bathing in the pale light at the edge of the fan oases. Perhaps we could understand more by analyzing the petal pollen and other particles they seem to absorb when filtering the oases' water. Behavior The analysis of petal pollen, which reveals them to be water bubbles, with a skin of waste matter, fails to add much more to our understanding of the water bulb. It's clear that they gain nutrients, and perhaps some of the oxygen housed in their interior, from their consumption of the pollen, but unlike the glowing fans, they don't seem to be reliant on it. Instead, they display a surprising level of passivity while absorbing and filtering much of their local environment. They seem to be without predators or prey, and are ignored by many other life forms. I've noticed that some specimens have buds, small growths which suggest they're growing clones of themselves to reproduce. Perhaps by carefully sampling one of these buds, we might get a miniature picture of the water bulb's anatomy. Theory. Analyzing a water bulb bud has provided an important insight into their anatomy. The bulbs themselves are mostly hollow, with only a thin membrane filled with pores, separating them and the water around. The interior side of this membrane is iridescent, lined with hexagonal crystals of guaianine, producing an effect like the eye shine seen terrestrial cats, sharks, and other creatures, but on a much larger scale. These crystals reflect light onto the sphere at the center of the bulb, which is in fact a huge and impossibly complex compound eye. This eye can see a broad spectrum of light, including UV and IR, with at least 36 different photoreceptor types. What are these water bulbs observing? And why then are they so passive? Just the thought of their total vision makes me nervous in their presence. Just a single incredibly complex compound eye. That is so cool. So that is an eye. Deep orary. We have observation and theory. Oraries are complex masses of polyps, tentacles, and other structures that form a web-like structure that swims as one. Unlike a terrestrial jellyfish, oraries appear to be asymmetrical, with marked differences even between individuals. Many of their orbiting sections are thin, blade-like membranes, but structures that resemble strings of translucent pearls, thread-like tentacles, and bulbous polyps also make up a large part of their bodies. Each orary has a central mass which is protected by a series of cloud-like soft membranes twisted around each other like a rose. Close encounters with oraries have shown them to be dangerous hunters, capable of tangling up and shocking their prey into submission. They also deploy shocks as a defensive measure when faced with larger creatures, like me. Perhaps further study of their prey may help. Theory Analysis of an orary polyp has demonstrated that they are indeed colonial creatures. They appear to be made up of both specialized animals of the same species and different creatures of different species. Based on this, the oraries may need to be reclassified, although that would require extensive study and equipment I don't have access to. What I can say about the oraries is that each one seems to have specialized its own growth based on its requirements. Many of the zooids that are part of the colony are able to shift between medusoid, dactylzooid, gonozooid, and gastrozooid forms with incredible speed, depending on whether the colony needs to focus on propulsion, feeding, defense, or digestion. This makes each orary a complex social and biological structure, like a floating city, rather than lone hunter. Cold fire bathers. We have everything for it. Observations. Cold fire bathers are pale, thick-stalked, 
trefoil plants found in the deep of Gliese 667cc's ocean. The only known specimens currently identified have all been found gathered around glowing fans, basking in their warm light. This suggests that the bathers are photosynthesizing this bioluminescence in order to live, and therefore cannot live outside of the sustaining glow of the fans. This has a knock-on effect for other life, as groupings of bathers then attract other creatures, perhaps to feed on or hide within them. The bathers also seem to produce a type of pollen, made up of small particles that float on the deep water currents. This may well be a seasonal or rare event that my visit has happened to coincide with, or a constant state. Further study of this pollen would be desirable. Behavior Analysis of bather pollen has shown that they are released around bubbles of oxygen, a waste product of the plant's photosynthesis. These bubbles are surrounded with a layer of pollen particles which weigh them down so they do not immediately rise to the surface. Instead, these bubbles drift through the water near the bather, and in many cases settle on the nearby fan. The fans then consume these bubbles, absorbing both the oxygen and pollen, along with anything else which reaches them. This direct exchange of energy and nutrients makes the fans and their bathers closely linked, a strong bond formed under the principle of mutual gain. Theories the sample we acquired of a bather root network shows the presence of bulbs within their root network. These bulbs appear to be a way for the bathers to store energy gained from their photosynthesis of the fan's bioluminescent light. Concealed in rocky cracks and the softer silty substrate of the seafloor, they must allow bathers to outlive fans which die off or stop producing light. This suggests that despite appearances, it's not the fans which maintain the bathers, but the other way around. The bathers then, despite appearing like worshippers of the fans, clustered around their bases, create the conditions for the fans to grow within, ensuring themselves a regular supply of light in exchange for oxygen. In a sense, the fans are their captives. Let's read the crew terminal. I know you have been reading these. The access logs show someone has been in the file system of my terminal. And, well, by process of elimination, it has to be you. I don't mind. In fact, I suppose I've been writing these entries for an imagined audience anyway. Uh, confessions, or maybe just a need to talk. We make a strange trio now. Me, a depressed xenobiologist who can't keep their mouth shut, you, an AI built from the remains of a sentient species, and your sister, Manet, who is now more plant than human. But as far as I can tell, we're the only ones on this planet who have any chance of finding out what happened here. I think I'm starting to understand why Manet called me here. It was because she trusted me not to give up, not to let this go. Let's not disappoint her. Okay. Another bike all facility sits here. Beneath the rocky shelf, it's labeled Site 2. Okay, that's very close to the place that we should now be able to break down the door of to get this sample of bloom froth. And where's the other site? Oh, that's a, a sample for an abyssal sail shell. Okay. Oh. Ah. Remember out here when we went to the east of the uh, pillar gardens? And there's a thing we needed to cut through, along with a very, very strange life form. It's out there. Site one. Was this the origin of everything that happened here? Yeah, I think I'm going to go there last. But first, let's go get the sample. Uh. 
Yeah, looks like it was this tail segment. Very easy to get that one. Oh, that updated multiple things. Abyssal sail shell, of course. Now we have behavior and a sketch. After finding a segment from a sail shell's tail, it seems obvious that these creatures use their tails for propulsion. But rather than flapping them like a flipper, the sail shells use their tails to catch currents and allow the flow of water to propel them through the deep ocean. Their tails and the rest of their shells are incredibly light, which means that even a mild flow is enough to grant them significant speed. This may also be why they follow the same paths. Their propulsion is best suited to using currents where they can find them, rather than choosing their own route. But why travel back, f back and forth through dangerous veiled territory over and over? Perhaps a look at a full sail shell, even a larval one, could help us understand this. Oh, we already understand that, because we already did the theory. Now it's just a sketch. They're so pretty. They look really elegant. Now we've got the behavior and sketch of the deep orary. Having analyzed some tissue from the orary's agile prey, we can begin to understand their behavior. Unable to match other creatures for speed, oraries seem to rely on the dangers presented by deep sea veils, beside which they are often found. Veils funnel cautious creatures into the orary's nets, while the oraries themselves don't seem to be affected by the veils and are able to traverse them easily. Perhaps the two have a symbiotic relationship, hunting together in a mutually beneficial manner? Outside of this, oraries appear to be mostly lone hunters, and I've seen no social interaction between individuals. But what exactly is an orary? I would like to understand more about their strange, uneven forms. Perhaps a polyp that had been shed might provide details on their anatomy. I suppose with how much they differ. Between individuals, there really is no one drawing or picture of them that could represent what they look like. Okay, let's now head back into the facility to the Arcology. Well, I'm going to cut out the whole exploration of the Arcology because it turns out I didn't really miss anything at all. There were three movement nodes that I hadn't visited, but they weren't anything significant. There were no logs or samples or anything in there. Yeah, I was actually really, really thorough the first time. Now I want to head over to Baikal site number two and also the froth sample that we need. So let's get going. Zoom on down there. Got a sphere fragment with me just in case I need more oxygen. But I don't think we'll have any issues. Because I know exactly where I'm going. Collapsed chamber. Choked with rock and sand, the metal chamber is deathly still. The angular shapes of industrial machinery lie in wait. I love how once we get into the bases, to the different sites, that the colors completely change and everything turns really intense. Melted pillars. The pillars which stretch up towards the cavernous roof of the chamber are warped and distorted, barely able to hold the weight. A 
rusting machinery, hulking machines built for industrial use, sit covered in a fine layer of sand and growth. This was a place where people worked. I want to explore this level before I go to any of these where I'm going to be going up or down. Rock piles. Half of the rock ceiling above the chamber seems to have come down at once, burying most of the room. Look, that tank. It's filled with microbial growth. What was this place? Be careful. The water will be just as toxic as it is above in the bloom. What are these creatures? Oh, that's the bloom froth, right. Huh. A tank of the bloom. Did they make the bloom? Did they bioengineer it as a weapon? Alright, well, it looks like we have to go into one of these. Let's go into the one that isn't dangerous first. Central vent. I imagine this was once a sealed tube stretching from floor to ceiling, but now it's just a round, ragged hole in the metal floor. Oh my. Okay, there's a lot to this. This is a whole thing, and as much as I really, really, really want to explore it, I know from experience when I get into this sort of thing, I can't stop until I'm completely done with the whole base, and then I'll have a two-hour recording, and it'll be midnight, and my throat is going to be dead, and I'm going to be starving. So, rather than that, I think I'm going to end the episode here. Hope you've enjoyed so far, and when we return, we're going to explore Site 2.